And, and who's... This segment is brought to you by Tenable Network Security, the creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Check out the new Nessus Enterprise and Nessus Enterprise Cloud. Engage your IT department in the vulnerability management process today. And the segment is also brought to you by BlackSquirrel.io. Pentest networks from your browser. Exploit the limits of network security through just a browser. Have a Chrome exploit in your root kit, in your toolkit, or your root kit. Uh, good, but for the rest of us, there's Black Squirrel. Visit BlackSquirrel.io for more information. I like how you made that flow. You like rootkit, toolkit, or, or both. Or both. It works, yeah. you know? <laughs> that was awesome. It's either way, you know? Sometime. So, um, big shout out to Eddie the Yeti. Oh, my gosh. Eddie was on the show, and uh, I made my do- – well, I haven't actually made my donation. It's in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I well, I, I made the donation for you. I made the donation to the sp- – uh, who did you make the donation to? That? Uh, so, we, well, the, the donation goes to Eddie, and Eddie supports both HFC and uh, the EFF. I, I got so. 90. Is that I owe you 10? <laughs> <laughs> I told you four hours ago. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm gonna take I it, thought I had more I'm in there. take it out in your hide. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, it's for, for that. No, time. that's the $100, or in my case, $90, $90 and 10 from Larry. Donation to the e- EFF. Is that and H- Hackers for Charity. And Hackers for Charity. Uh, and we bought our original prints that Eddie made out of um, his uh, soy sauce. Face it, yeah, soy sauce. Go um, listen to the segment le- on the show. It's all yeah, it's really juice. cool. Yep. Yeah, he's hacking art, and we now I can put up a picture of myself, which is just what everyone wanted here in the security right, studio. Right. It's a picture of me. Yes, and you know I bought mine as well, and actually I had to buy yours because you had already left when he released them for yes, sale. Yes. Yes. Um, and uh, I because seri- no one else wanted to buy them. <laughs> uh, I, ser- I seriously considered giving you mine and keeping yours. We should have a picture <laughs> of each other in each other's offices. That would be sweet. I was going to hang mine over the bed. Actually, that's a good. You know, <laughs> I think our wives would have maybe liked it even more if we swapped and then hung them over the bed. That would would that be weird? That would be weird. Be yeah, weird. problem is that it would be salty, but not by the soy sauce. That's right. Oh. Carlos is here with us. Welcome, Carlos. Sorry. Don't <laughs> worry. I know that. You tend to forget me. Uh, no, oh. it's not. No, now you make me feel bad, dude. You should feel bad. You, 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 <laughs> you always do. You always <laughs> does. You know what? He didn't introduce me either, Paul. Uh, uh, Carlos. I, did I forget to introduce everyone? Yep. I'm an idiot. Yep. No, you know what? Never mind. I take that back. I'm an asshole. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Tell us something we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but we all uh, still get along. That's the point. Uh, yes. Uh. Um. So, Carlos and Larry, welcome to the show. <laughs> Is it too late for that? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, <coughs> Daniel Ayub. Did I say that right? You did. Ayub. Yeah. Ayub. Ayub. Daniel Ayub. Daniel, welcome to the show. It's nice to have you here. Thank you for having me. Hi. Um, so, uh, in addition to Carlos and Larry, <laughs> we have Daniel. Uh, Daniel and I met at DEF CON. Uh, they flagged me down probably on Friday when I was slightly intoxicated from some <laughs> listeners that brought us gifts of the alcoholic beverage kind. Um, or maybe it was Saturday. Which you neglected to share with me. <laughs> well, you weren't th- there. Because okay. everyone asked me, where's Larry? Dude, that was the running joke throughout the entire conference. <laughs> everyone comes up to me and it's like, Where, where's Larry? They're like, oh, first I'll hey, Paul, where's Larry? But no one goes up to Larry and goes, Where's Paul? Paul? So I was telling people, you're going to go up to Larry and ask where Paul is. So did anyone do that? No. Yes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All of them. Just it was lying. really annoying. Make me feel better. <laughs> but Daniel and I met at uh, DEF CON. And Daniel, well, who's your partner's name? Your business Jock. partner. Jock. Jock. Your business partner. And you're like, Paul, we have this really cool idea. We started this company. We think it's really cool. We have this really cool hardware hacking device. We know you're into like hardware type embedded device stuff. And we want to make a device to protect grandma. And that really resonated with me because protecting grandma is important from the evils of the internet. Uh, so <coughs> Daniel is now working full time on a product called iGuardian. And while it is uh, uh, tailored towards grandma, um, he's holding a, a, it up, uh, the product up rather now yes uh it is tailored at grandma um is there's some really cool geeky stuff under the hood that i wanted everyone to hear and who knows maybe it's something you can use to help protect grandma so daniel <laughs> take it away thank you paul first so, uh, wait a minute now every entrepreneur right mm-hmm. 
You need an elevator pitch. So, Daniel, I'm going to put you on the spot. What's your elevator pitch? Okay, the more connected devices you add into your home, the more larger you're making the attack surface, right? Mm -hmm. Consumer electronics in general have uh, a pretty bad reputation in the industry for having a lot of different vulnerabilities, and the vendors don't always release patches in a timely manner. Even if they do release a patch, uh, a lot of times consumers don't know even how to install them. So trying to make something to mitigate a lot of the risk that people have uh, with the more devices that are connecting to their home networks. Uh, trying to develop something that's very, very powerful and useful so that anybody who's like an advanced user and wants to be able to tinker with it, uh, there's a lot of really good stuff there. Uh, but also easy enough that someone like my mom can just plug it in and uh, have at least a baseline of protection. So, can I make a recommendation for a shorter, even shorter pitch? <laughs> okay. You take this device and you plug it in between your computer and the internet and it protects your shit. Huh? huh? There you go. Huh? I mean, that's essentially what it does, right? Yes, right. exactly. So, uh -huh. it's a small embedded system running OpenWRT as the uh, base operating system. And then I've got Snort installed as an inline IPS. So it basically like, sits on the wire. Yeah. Sorry? My first question for Daniel, when he said, well, it's MIPS, it's running OpenWare, and it's running Snort as an inline IPS. And I said, whoa, whoa, and I stopped him right there. I'm like, whoa, 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 back up, back up. So you mean to tell me that you compiled Snort with OpenWRT for MIPS? And he just looked at me, and he was like, like, you could see, like, in his eyes, like, there were many nights where he was crying uncontrollably. <laughs> <laughs> you could see the, like, look of horror. He was still scarred yes. very deeply from that process. Yes. I'm like, dude, I, I totally respect you now. I'm like, you're going to come on the show. Anyone that's <laughs> willing to fall on the sword like that for the rest of us, because that is not fun. Cross-compiling yeah. large open source applications like that uh, for MIPS is painful. Yeah, um, so the MIPS product will be the, the production unit. The prototype that we've got right now is a dual-core ARM, but even that uh, wasn't fun. Yeah, to ARM be is a to... little better, but it's still not fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, so, yeah, the product is, like you said, it's just uh, basically OpenWRT is the base OS running on a, a dual-core MIPS platform, uh, and you'll be able to you know customize it and tweak it as you see fit. Um, I've got, actually, I'm connected behind one of them right now, and if it's okay, I can show you some of the console and some of the stuff that we've got there. Sure. Absolutely. Right. Share away. Awesome. So, uh, Daniel, while you're doing that, <clears throat> yeah. what type of attacks are you specifically targeting? I mean, we yeah. all know that the IPSs can't protect you from everything, right? But are there, right. like, a, a good percentage of the attacks that in a certain class that you can identify that really – this platform can, you know, snort with the existing rules or rules that you've customized really help yeah. protect us against? Yeah, so I'm um, really trying to go after a lot of the embedded systems that people have in their homes and uh, kind of focusing a lot on malware callbacks and things like that so mm -hmm. that if somebody's system were compromised, uh, we could actually block that CNC communication going out. Uh, oh, yeah, that's sure. a big one for a lot of people that just are using basic uh, AV. A lot of times AV gets disabled the first thing when they get infected. Uh, we're also trying to provide, uh, you know, if you look at just the wireless routers in general, there are tons of vulnerabilities in those kind of devices. So oh, long term, I know all be, too well. <clears throat> sorry, I said I know all too well. I'm actually teaching a class at Sands on embedded systems assessments for the rest of us. Yep. Um, yeah. So there's there's definitely a lot on there. Um, I've got so if we look at the rules files, what I'm kind of showing here is uh, I've got several different um, things going Daniel, on. I, I'm told by my uh, production staff that you need to make it bigger. And I, I, I think they're referring to the text on your screen. <laughs> Is that better? Okay. No bigger. You like the text. Yeah. Control shift plus. Yeah, I, oh. I did that. Keep going. Oh, maybe no. we're waiting for an update. Oh, it might be a lag on Skype. Okay. So I'm intrigued by these domains. I basically the pulled out side. a couple. You see that? Yeah, I don't know if your screen's yeah. updating or not. <clears throat> ah, okay. Yeah, I see it now. Wow. Oh, wow. Hey, there okay. Yeah, Skype was just updating. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. No worries. Um, so these just a couple of the rules on the box. They're all configured in reject mode, and you can see these are just DNS queries to known bad uh, agents. So if I come in here and I do a simple NS lookup, 
you can see it'll actually uh, hang and not be able to resolve the domain because uh, Snort is intercepting that and then blocking it. Uh, if I do one to a good domain, it'll go through with no problem. Uh, give it a second here. Just It tries a couple times and then sure. it times out. Can you, can you make that bigger too? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so if I do a, a simple one, just to like appall.com.com, you can see it resolves right away. If I try to do one to one that's uh, perhaps uh, bad, like the ones that I've got rules on the box for, you can see it'll it'll kind of block them out there. So now you you are obviously updating that list at a regular interval as well. Yeah, exactly. So this thing will sit there um, and pull down the latest rule sets automatically. We pre-process them ahead of time and convert them into drop rules. And then uh, the box will reach out and pull them down on a regular cadence. Uh, if we look at the rule file that's on there, you can see the last test that I just ran right now um, at 2300. Uh, you can see the URL that was dropped and then uh, the, the log that comes in showing that it happened. Right. Cool. Yeah. So it's, um, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful tool so that People who really want to be able to control their networks and be able to lock it down. Uh, a lot of times if you look at what it costs to actually build a snort box, um, you're going to wind up spending a couple hundred dollars just on the hardware alone. Uh, and by having something like this, you really have a, a really, you know, a good system that can handle a lot of the throughput uh, that you'd usually pay uh, two or three times as much for. Um, in order for us to be able to do it and bring the product to market, we need to produce at least 800 circuit boards just to get the volume pricing down so that it's affordable for everybody. Um, so if you guys like the project, please uh, help us and, and support it. Uh, back us on Kickstarter. Um, it's uh, ibisnetworks.com slash Kickstarter. So. Yeah, there's a link in the show notes, too, on the resources section <coughs> for this interview um, that links to the Kickstarter project. Um, so tell us a little more about the hardware, Daniel. Okay. So the production unit that we're making uh, for the Kickstarter campaign is actually based on a Cavium Oction system on a chip. Uh, that's a dual core MIP64 processor running at one gigahertz. Uh, the real specialty related to that type of chip is that it's got an application acceleration processor for doing offloading for deep packet inspection, layer seven matching, uh, PCRE, and then regular expression matching at a very, very fast rate. Hmm. So it can offload a lot of those routines from the processor and allow you to have uh, very good uh, performance for, for network inspection. It's really kind of geared for this type of an application. Nice. If you look at some of the larger enterprise firewalls that are out there in the market from people like Palo Alto or Juniper or other uh, large vendors, you find that they're using the exact same CPU. Uh, the difference is that they're using a 24 core or a 48 core, and they're putting two or three of them on the board, and we're using a dual core version of that same chip. Oh, wow. Yeah, if and it, you, they're all one gigabyte of RAM. Uh, so the the board that we're producing has that dual core one gigahertz chip at the MIP sixty four, and then it's also using a one gig of DDR three and sixty four mega flash three giggy interfaces, and I've got a full size SD card slot on there for logs and rule retention. Nice. Is it's a S it's a pretty kick ass system in the sense that the hardware itself is about two times the compute power of the next closest commercial firewall, and it's about one-tenth of the price. Hmm. Hmm. Is the SD card slot accessible by the end user? Yeah, it's going to be uh, accessible. It'll be a little cut out in the case so that you can actually pull that out and pop it into your system if you want to pull the logs off that way or load your own rules, something like that. <clears throat> and this can sit in line as a layer two device or yes. you can enable it as a layer three device as well? That's correct. So there are a couple of different deployment modes. One of the things that's kind of neat about this, uh, we filed for a patent on it. It's actually a little switch that sits on the front of the box. So if you put it in mode zero, it'll turn the box into a transparent layer two bridge and it'll sit there as a bump in the wire kind of invisible type of deployment. If you put it in mode one, it runs as a layer three router and then you get a LAN, a WAN and a DMZ. And if you put it in mode two, then you can customize it however you like. 
So it's uh, very flexible. If you want to make a spanning port, mirroring port, you want to turn it into a web server instead of a snort box, there's, there's a lot of flexibility there. So while your target market is um, for the end user, a lot of us security professionals could buy one of these relatively cheaper, cheaply rather, and do what yeah. we want with them essentially. Exactly. I mean, that's really the, the target that I'm going for with the Kickstarter is a lot of, you know, not just for friends and family and people that don't know much about security, but the box is really geared so that folks like us who know what we're doing there's a lot of stuff there that's really, really good that you can you can play with and, and really kind of uh, build your own system, so to speak. There's a lot of uh, capabilities that we're not yet even scratching the surface of. Um, and it's smaller than a banana. Yes. <laughs> I love that picture. It's a great picture. <laughs> but larger than a pack of gum. Just, right. Yeah. So the PCB will be about the size of a cellular phone. Okay. okay. And I've got a, um, a drawing or a schematic of the industrial design up on the Kickstarter page. It'll be a brushed aluminum case. Uh, so that, And then the, the product itself is being designed to be fanless. So it's just using a, a passive heat sink and that aluminum case to help dissipate a lot of the uh, heat. The chip itself is quite low power. It operates at like 5 to 7 watts. So it's, it's perfect for that type of application. What's the power adapter requirements? Is it like a 12-volt? Yeah, it'll it'll likely be like a 12 volt type of adapter, and we'll have a, a little barrel connector there. Um, to be honest, a lot of the certifications required to get UL cert and things like that are quite expensive. So we'll probably be looking to use an adapter that's already got that kind of certification to it. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So the the current uh, power connector is that green connector, right? And that, but that's obviously the uh, the prototype yeah. design. So that's more uh, industrial type thing, and then that's really what we're using for the prototype. You'll see we also only have uh, two giggy interfaces instead of three, and the SD card on this one is actually inside the case, and it's a micro SD that isn't uh, really easy to get to. Uh, but being able to put it into bridge mode and then have a third interface for management and sucking down rules was uh, pretty important. Sure. If I take it out of the case, you can see the board itself. This is the prototype, right? That's a dual core arm, and then there's a little daughter board there that you snap in the uh, the other adapters and stuff. Nice. And have you stress tested it? Let's say with uh, a heavy load and how many megabits is it doing with the IPS enabled and the IPS disabled? Yeah. So um, I've run it stress testing in the house. I've hooked it up to like an Exia system. Uh, without Snort running, I was getting close to 80 megabytes through the ARM platform running on a single core with 256 megs of RAM. Uh, when I have all the Snort rules loaded up, about 5,200 of them, and I've got the preprocessors kind of tuned and optimized so that there's uh, you know a finite number of sessions and kind of uh, carving up the memory appropriately. Uh, when I do that, I get about 20 meg out of uh, a single core ARM 600. Uh, when we move to the Oction platform, uh, the MIP system, we expect to be able to achieve uh, several multiples of that in, in total performance and throughput. Nice. That's pretty darn impressive. Thanks. It's, uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's a, it's a really hard, um, you know, wor a lot of hard work that goes into it. But I think a lot of people can really benefit from something like this. And if you've ever had to like clean your mother-in-law's laptop on your Saturday weekend or Saturday and Sunday because she's got you know four or five Trojans that she she downloaded and installed, uh, something like this makes a lot of sense to be able to you know mitigate again a lot of the risk. It's it's not a silver bullet. It's not a replacement for good security practices and good hygiene, but it is another tool that we can provide to people and uh, something that's not really available today. So, have you worked with Snort before, Daniel? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been playing with it for a couple of years, just uh, as a hobbyist, and I worked as a product manager for uh, another IPS vendor for a while, so I've paid attention to them in terms of uh, competitive capabilities, features that are built in there, stuff like that. But so a lot of it was you, um, uh, 
doing uh, RTFM, right? Really just yeah. spending the time and learning how to do it the right way. Sure. Did you have to compile Snort for multiple cores, especially? Did you have to... Uh, so right now it's running just on the single core, but yeah, Snort is single threaded. So if you want to run it on multiple cores, you basically got to slice it up and then, uh, you know, what's going to be inspected on core one versus core zero and then run multiple instances of it. Gotcha. Um, in the initial version, we'll be probably running it on the single core based on the uh, reference design that we've uh, talked to the engineering company and they, they've told us that board should be able to get at least 50 megabits uh, just on a single core. Uh, without too too much optimization, when we fully tune it and optimize it with all the hooks in the SDK, we should get a couple multiples of that uh, to be able to get uh, significantly higher throughput. But if you think about what people have going into their homes today, yeah, fifty no, megabits is is pretty, uh, especially here in the states. That that's a pretty good pipeline. And what's the f uh, full retail price? Yeah, so we're selling them on Kickstarter for one hundred and forty nine dollars. Uh, that includes uh, access to community and open source rules. If you want to uh, subscribe to a premium subscription from uh, Emerging Threats or Sourcefire, you have the ability to do that as well. The MSRP we're targeting uh, when we actually give this thing to retail will be closer to uh, 179 Cool. And I think if you go on the Kickstarter page right now, I've got a couple of them left still at the uh, 129 level. So hurry there, up and <laughs> get them before they go. There are 39 left. Uh, 129. Yep. Yeah. So some of the other questions that I'd have, obviously, you want to be able to make it for um, other folks to be able to to play with and tinker for the uh, um, for the, the the more advanced folks. Um, how open are you going to be with uh, the project? Uh, am I going to be able to download firmware? Am I going to be able to compile my own firmware? Yes. Um, all of that good stuff. Yes. So we're planning on pushing everything back into the community. It's, it's intended to be a 100% open source software platform. Uh, we might not release the hardware schematics just for you know obvious reasons, but the, the software will be 100% open source. We'll have the SDK available as well as uh, any code that we contribute you know, to the project and getting it up there. Awesome. awesome. Do you guys run Snort? You guys have a Snort box running at home? Uh, I have not personally run Snort in some time. And I do not currently now, um, mostly because it's just a hangover from my old PF Sense box <laughs> that didn't have the power to do so. I may yeah. spend one hundred and twenty nine dollars after the show. And <laughs> yeah. That, awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, Daniel, thank you so much. I encourage our listeners to check out the Kickstarter page. You can find it in the link in the show notes for episode three hundred and eighty three. Daniel, are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? I am ready. Three right. words to describe yourself. Hacker, father, and entrepreneur. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? I think I'd be an axe murderer. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Uh, it's a long way to the top. If you want to rock and roll. In the yeah, popular exactly. <laughs> game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? I've been thinking about this one. I think going first has some advantages. Okay, so first. Uh, pick two celebrities who could be your parents. That's a tough one. Um, I'm going to go with Samuel L. Jackson. Oh, oh nice. nice. That's a good one. Yeah. And uh, Tina Fey. Nice. nice. Oh, wow. Oh. Damn. Larry, pick a random number from 1 through 11, but not 6. 3. If we came to your house for dinner, what would you prepare for us to eat? Lasagna, because I make a bomb lasagna. Bomb-alicious, nice. even. bomb -alicious lasagna may be the next thing that Daniel creates as an entrepreneur and patent that fine bomb -alicious bomb -alicious lasagna. bomb lasagna. Nice. Daniel, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. It was a pleasure meeting you at DEF CON. I wish you the best on your new product, iGuardian. Super cool. Um... <clears throat> and I know it's kind of like product placement with iGuardian, but you can download all the software. It's free. It's open source. Uh, it's a really cool open work distribution with a really cool version of Snort uh, already compiled for you. So if you want to just go run that, <coughs> excuse me, which MIPS platforms will that work with, Daniel? Uh, so it's being uh, compiled for a MIPS 64 and specific to the Cavium Octeon. Okay. So if you wanted yeah. to go find your own hardware, you could conceivably go run it on, on that. Yeah, the, the Octeon 3 is the latest generation of that CPU, and that's what we're targeting for, for this project. 
Daniel, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. We hope that uh, you come back in like a year and you're like a millionaire. <laughs> thank you, Bob. Very awesome. Kind. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks. And with that, we are going to take a short break, come back, and talk about the stories for this week. You know what someone said about our pizza? What? Looks like a non-optimal compression algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> it was still edible, though. <laughs> it was. It was. We'll be right back. Thank you.